Uh, First, uh, I want to acknowledge that uh, today we're having this meeting on the unceded territory of the Kanawake, a place that has served as a site of meeting and traditional exchange amongst many nations. Um, I recognize and respect that the Kanahane uh, Nation and are, not, are traditional custodians of the land and the waters on which we are meeting today. So it is my pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, I am coming to you to talk about SPIN, a Software Preservation Training and, uh, Training and Education Working Group. Um, I'm going to be talking about two case studies, uh, the webinars and in-depth interviews that the working group has been uh, coming uh, up with and is in process currently. Um, and also talk about, coming from my own background, um, digital humanities projects and the relationship to software preservation from that aspect. So, hello, I'm Elizabeth. Um, I was the former CLEAR uh, Digital Humanities postdoctoral fellow at the University of Toronto, so I got a chance to work across uh, three campuses. U of T is a vast and distributed place. Um, it is hosting um, upwards of probably 15 to 20 digital humanities projects at any one time with researchers who are coming in and out of those fields. Um, so it's a really exciting place, but it also brings up logistical questions. We have something like 30 plus libraries, uh, places where um, all of this kind of research data sits, uh, interacts um, you know, from the hardware all the way up through uh, the software. <coughs> Currently, I'm a course instructor of Chinese media and culture at U of T, um, which is what my doctoral research is in, um, and a member of the training and education working group at SPIN, which is how I am involved today. Uh, so currently, I'm thinking about how to include software preservation as a part of the undergrad and graduate curricula. Um, because I'm in the classroom a lot right now, I have about 150 students, and I'm often thinking about what does the software practices in my own teaching pedagogy, as well as my students' production of software um, and research objects, digital objects, uh, how that can tie into these uh, longer questions, uh, these longer term questions of software preservation and archiving. So I thought I'd start, because it's the afternoon uh, and people might be tired, um, I was hoping to ask you to estimate the number of software that you've used <laughs> since yesterday um, and to sort of jot those down um, and in ways in which they play in our like personal lives as well as our professional experiences. I'm also uh, the Association of Internet Researchers is having their conference in Montreal right now as well. So I've just come from a lot of talks where we're talking about platformization, uh, app studies, and all of these kind of uh, spaces where software are, is the kind of specter in the room where people are talking about the uses of the specter or uses of the software, but not this kind of like actual haunting uh, question of what happens when Facebook pulls a particular app in integration. Does anyone have a number that's probably out of out of this world? How many? Uh, I'd probably use 50 to 100 pieces of software. <laughs> okay, that far exceeds any of <laughs> what I, I feel like that, that wins the, anyone exceed 50 to 100? No. Okay, um, so getting, um, getting these kinds of numbers or asking when students are organizing around group projects, the number of integrations that uh, are now being offered through, we've, we've just switched our content management system to Canvas. And so the ways in which students are moving between different uh, software applications um, is, is also amplifying the number of softwares that I'm interacting with. So I'm thinking about how can, how can I th think through uh, what will happen in the future if software is not maintained. So SPIN as a platform um, has these working groups, uh, research metadata standards, law and policy, tech infrastructure, and training and education. Uh, these are all uh, interrelated. There are various um, standing meetings of each of the groups, and then there, there's an all hands on deck meeting. So these are all iterative and interrelated. As I'm sure many of you are aware, we should care because software touches everything and, and anything in our world right now. So um, domains of software are mediating uh, how we generate knowledge, how we communicate knowledge. Um, they are negotiating cultural norms. So I have students who are very happy to work in WeChat in the ecosphere of a, of a Chinese media platform, um, but are frustrated when, for instance, on Facebook, you can't pay. There's no pay application the way there is through WeChat. So thinking about the way in which negotiation 
transitions of uh, cultural norms across domains is happening, and is it's software that is that kind of um, the fascia that's that's com uh, connecting these things. So software is a dependency. It's a, also a cultural record. Um, there are many different use cases, all of which touch upon the spaces that we are interested in, probably as part of force. Uh, so scholarly communication, education, uh, exposure to information, medicine, criminal justice, transportation. I'm interested. I'm really also interested in smart cities and the Internet of Things and how uh, software uh, integrates into spaces like um, the city state of Singapore and how cars and uh, sensors are constantly speaking to each other through various software. So one of the challenges that, um, that software preservation presents to us is that no single institution can collect, buy, or otherwise procure all the software they need to access their existing born digital collection material. Uh, an implication of this means that uh, to enable sharing and coordinated collection um, uh, development is needed for software. The second challenge is intellectual property, and at this moment of a renegotiated NAFTA 2.0, I can't remember the new acronym, um, the extension of copyright um, uh, regimes coming out of that, if adding an extra 20 years um, to Canadian copyright as a, as a part of NAFTA 2.0 is really important. Um, so for instance, Neil and the discussion around software citation will, and intellectual property will obviously uh, have to be rediscussed now that this deal has recently been signed. Um, so an implication uh, is that it's a means of leveraging existing tools and national context and to share a body of anecdotal evidence from researchers and practitioners, which has a second order value for understanding technical and training needs. A third challenge is preservation strategies have not been scaled for software. Um, the implication being that it's a means to lower the uh, barrier and leverage the existing ecosystem of digital preservation networks and service providers. So uh, the way in which we think on a, you know, if we think about a one researcher and the software preservation techniques for me alone, is diff it's difficult to scale to a much larger scale of U of T one campus, U of T three campuses. So fourth and final challenge among many, um, it is a changing distribution model from installation media to software as service. Um, to go back to the internet, uh, the Association of Internet Researchers, the relationship between how platforms, uh, platformization is constantly uh, changing, how content is being provided um, or not uh, is constantly shifting. So even defining what is a platform becomes a problem uh, for researchers of uh, of platforms. The implication is aligning and articulating shared needs and interests becomes uh, a really important part of this. So SPIN uh, operates in distinct domains but has similar challenges, so they're often overlooping and iterative. So uh, we have discussions around public service, metadata and de uh, metadata standards, law and policy, training and education related to then research data management, uh, and all of uh, and then all of those same spaces are also feeding into discussions around archives and special collections. So SPIN takes a collective impact uh, approach. It is a community of practice. So uh, we have a common agenda, shared measurements, uh, reinforcing activities, constant communication, and um, it has SPIN has a kind of space that occupies as a kind of backboard, uh, backbone organization. So. My first case study, that's a kind of overview of what SPIN is, involved, uh, what SPIN is seeing itself as being involved in. Um, the case study I want to focus in on was this recent, um, this past spring, we did a six part webinar series in collaboration with the DPC, uh, the Digital Preservation Coalition in the UK, um, where we uh, produced peer reviewed and then hosted uh, these uh, webinars. We began with an overview of what software preservation is and can do and why we need to pay attention to it. Uh, we looked at software collection development, so uh, places like Tate, uh, the Canadian Centre for Architecture that are actively acquiring software uh, collections in order to then be able to allow researchers access to it. So for instance, um, CCA, Canadian Centre for Architecture, in, in uh, collaboration with the American Institute of 
Architects, AIA, has uh, collected these huge number of uh, architecture software, so CAD systems, that are now um, being emulated and digitally preserved at CCA in order to provide um, historians, architectural historians, a way in which to think through uh, the digital spaces in which architects were working at a particular moment in time. We've also looked at software reuse cases, so um, where scholars are, are looking through uh, software as a, as a methodology. Uh, and then the one I hosted was software and digital and scholarly communications. We also looked at scaling software preservation and emulation, so this gets into some of the affiliated programs with SPIN, uh, including EASY. Um, and the final one was an overview of current trends and their legal implications. So for this next part, I just want to, I'm going to use the slides that I used in the webinar. I just want to mention that they are all available on, the recordings are all available on the SPIN website, as well as the audio transcripts and related. So one of the other things we wanted to do as a group is provide a space where all of the related links and readings could also be accessed so that this would serve as a kind of archive of this, mo this moment in software preservation discussions. So in episode four, which I hosted, um, I was looking at software and scholarly communications. Uh, because I work in the Canadian context, I was particularly interested in the scholarly communications roadmap of 2017 that was uh, put out by Carl. Um, and of their five key uh, findings, the second one that I was focusing in on was to promote and accelerate the adoption of open science platforms, which they uh, define as in this context, open science is used in the broadest sense and encompasses all domains of research, including the social science and the humanities. So open science is used uh, commonly in Europe and has been defined as the practice of research in such a way that others can collaborate, contribute, uh, where research data, lab notes, and other research processes are freely available under the terms that enable reuse, redistribution, and reproduction of the research in its underlying data and methods. So it's really interesting to me that there's a, um, a, an active outreach towards the humanities to think about these open science practices. Um, and it's something that, that that conversation, I think, within digital humanities research is really important uh, to think about the way in which research data management, uh, this kind of uh, reusability, rep uh, redistribution, and reproducibility uh, is something that we can really strive for in the digital humanities space. The second part of the Carl Scarlett Communications Roadmap that I think is important for this idea of software preservation is the fifth one, which is expanding the types of research outputs that contribute to the formal scholarly communication system. So um, coming out of discussions and uh, in, in some of our major funding bodies in Canada, including the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, or SHRC, um, the need to make our data open um, and available is, is becoming part of uh, the SHRC mandate, is now part of the SHRC mandate, as well this idea of research creation. So this is a research that is part of a creative process, um, and this is and these are now funding mandates that um, that we are seeing in, in the space that makes sense for a digital humanities project to apply for funding. As a as related quote, a uh, scholar is saying that uh, Carl is saying that research outputs are rapidly evolving and increasingly reflect new or blended forms of scholarship that support research and education. So this, for me, is most definitely talking about the space of digital humanities. And one of the projects that I'm most familiar with um, is the Digital Tools for Manuscript Study, uh, which is a project at U of T Libraries in the Center for Medieval Studies. Um, so it develops, it's developed and refined tools that enhance the research experience of digital manuscript scholars. The project advances the goals of data interoperability and portability by using uh, international image interoperability framework, otherwise known as IIIF, uh, and web annotation specifications and tools compliant with these specifications. They are developing a content management system using Omeka, which is user-oriented in its simple design and has significant traction already in the scholarly community. Um, and the collation tool, which you see at left here, is the, uh, is the visualization tool VizCall. So all of these uh, tools that are part of this ecosystem of digital, human or digital tools for manuscript study are based on this idea of, um, of open science and the idea of being uh, interoperable, uh, portable, reproducible, um, and being well software that's being well documented and uh, archivable. The second part of uh, the first case study is, uh, is a forthcoming set of in-depth interviews with various practitioners um, 
including the software heritage's uh, Roberto de Cosmo. Uh, we're building interlocking communities of practices through these in-depth interviews, um, and this will be coming um, in, the, in the early 2019. The second case study I wanted to bring up today uh, is the space of digital humanities. So again, to go back to this project that I'm most familiar with, um, the idea of having code uh, discoverable on GitHub, uh, having it hosted as a collaborative project across the libraries uh, and the Center for Medieval Studies with a variety of lab members who uh, meet regularly and come into uh, a space where they share, you know, um, the, the developers are discussing with the content specialists, you know, does this collation make sense for uh, somebody who is a specialist in medieval manuscript collation? Um, the idea of being able to annotate, um, what are the things that you would need to be able to annotate with, that you would you know, want to be able to annotate if you could annotate a, a manuscript and then using uh, Omeka in order to make that possible. What I think is also important here in, in the relationship to software preservation is how then can this project be communicated, how is this project communicated out to other scholars and other researchers who are working within that space of digital humanities um, so that this, uh, so uh, communities of practice like that around uh, Zotero and Omeka uh, sustain and, um, and grow that kind of community rather than it being a, a tool that's for, a purpose-built tool for one instance that uh, then is uh, either sustained or not. So to go back to this slide where we were talking about distinct domains and similar challenges, uh, many of these issues with um, multi-institution uh, collaborations end up uh, in this space where we need to discuss law and policy issues. So if you have a collaborator who's uh, on, in the EU, the relationship between data privacy and policy in the EU versus that in Canada versus that in the US versus in Hong Kong or in China. Um, the metadata standards, uh, that whether it's a decision to use Dublin Core or use another standard, uh, becomes a discussion that then is it, that becomes baked into your software. So those discussions need to happen uh, early and often. Uh, and also this idea around research data management and the, um, the infrastructure needed for, um, I say, uh, an early career researcher in the humanities who's undertaking uh, maybe the first digital humanities project. Um, what? What does a research data management plan look like? What software are you going to use in order to build that research data management uh, plan? Um, and thinking through how to scale that um, capacity either in the libraries and departments in both um, are, are all things that are of interest to me and, and, as a, a, and related to software. So um, in this final case study, I'm, I'm thinking through digital humanities in the classroom. So if students are producing um, digital objects using various different softwares, how, um, as, a, uh, as an educator, can I then feed that information back to librarians in the, uh, or librarians and IT professionals? Um, what is supported? What isn't supported? Does it sit within fair use dealing so I can make the website available uh, publicly, or do I need to make it password protected? Um, thinking through research data management and citation, uh, as well as preservation, encouraging practices that, um, that give the students giving credit to where credit is due, um, and thinking about how to create connections to communities of practice. So uh, for instance, at U of T, there's a very active group called U of T Coders, um, which is a student-led group that runs um, various teaching. It's, it's sort of built on the um, software carpentry model. So uh, they're often hosting uh, weekly events where you can come and learn more about Git, learn you know the the basics of R or Python um, how can we then connect students in the, in the undergrad classroom um, and give them the tools in which uh, they will definitely need in uh, further education either in grad school or in a um, in a work environment okay so what I thought I'd do, well, this is about 20 minutes, so uh, I'll leave my contact information up, but I thought I would keep it relatively short in hopes that we could have uh, a, a more robust 
conversation and question time now. Uh, this is this particular presentation is really based on these um, these experiences that I've had as a as a member of the Software Preservation Network, um, coming from a very specific disciplinary background um, and thinking through these uh, all the things I did wrong in my uh, archival research and what a mess my research photographs are. I have you know eight thousand photographs that are uh, <coughs> variously tagged or not. Um, but thinking about how to uh, how to start leading by example through my own practices in the classroom or through my own publications, um, thinking through things like um, how what softwares. Uh, I use and wish I could still use and don't. Um, there is also now a push to use um, statistical software in digital humanities spaces where it brings up questions of usability and um, the kind of things that we take for granted uh, if we had taken statistics that we maybe as somebody who didn't take statistics would start to use in vivo and, and wonder, uh, oh, why am I getting this kind of result that looks so nice and clean? Um, so to think about the, the implications and I think in the classroom um, through and in the library spaces, it's really an exciting moment to think about how software and the software preservation and those conversations can happen uh, at students at all levels, at early career researchers uh, and more senior um, faculty. So, that's. And just if you have a question, please use the microphone so because we are being recorded. The preservation, <coughs> I mean, I would comment more from the digital preservation perspective. I see a bigger challenge in terms of, I mean, before software preservation, the question is, what is the hardware preservation strategies? Uh, we are going very high speed on the digital space in terms of keeping content. But the reality is, the life of digital content is far less than the physical content. Papers survive a couple of centuries. Digital data does not do that. So I see that there's a bigger challenge in terms of software preservation is the hardware on which that software would be available. Because it is, it is much faster that that, that hardware is getting uh, outdated. So the related question which I would like your comments on is, are you working on effective migration strategies? Because software cannot, in my view, be preserved. It is the migration strategies of the data that need to be thought out in terms of the preservation. So what is SPN's view on that? Thank you. That's a, it, you're absolutely uh, spot on. That's a great question. Uh, I, my own expertise does not facilitate an answer to that. So, so perhaps I can open it up to you, <laughs> to, to Neil. <laughs> Hi there, so uh, I'm Neil Chu Hong. I'm also a member of the SPIN um, training education uh, working group, but I guess uh, also part of the Software Sustainability Institute where we've been doing work around um, understanding just the sorts of problems that you've been talking about there. Uh, it is a challenge. I think it's a challenge um, moving forward that is becoming easier um, as most uh, software that is in use migrates towards things which are not tied to a particular piece of hardware. That's obviously not the case for some specialist software that's involved directly with, for instance, um, collection of data from sensors or, or so on. But in general, a lot of software now is moving on to uh, more agnostic platforms. It is a big challenge for uh, a p uh, you know the last couple of decades of software, and I think that's where our big challenge um, lies. And there are differing views around this, whether you go for trying to emulate the hardware and thus move and migrate the software itself onto platforms that can be maintained more easily, or you take an approach which is more around trying to understand how to keep the hardware going, which is, for instance, people like uh, Computer History Museum do, do a lot of work on. And I, I think you sort of see the two different approaches. So Internet Archive have been going much more down emulation and migration, and others have been going down uh, a different route. And I think the answer there is it's still very much a work in progress, but it's one that a lot of the large collections, particularly in libraries and museums, are really worried about. Um, and if you have your own perspective, then please do talk to me later on. So. Yeah. 